Good morning, church family. Morning. It is good to be back together again. Last week, I was away at our association meetings, uh, the annual meetings for the Northwest region of the North American Baptist Conference. And so I wanted to bring just a little bit of an update this morning about what went on and what that was like. And we began on Thursday night and Friday morning with meetings of the executive team. The executive team is like the elder board for the entire region. And this was my second year serving on that team and first year serving as the president of that team. Friday night, uh, we started the official conference, and Friday through Sunday, we had four worship gatherings where we had a guest speaker who was a retired missionary pilot who spoke about humility, and we had updates from about 12 of our uh, churches who just shared what God has been doing, and it's always so good to see that the God that we see at work here at CCBC is at work everywhere. And he's doing things that we will never see, we'll never get to hear about, but he is at work. Uh, Saturday morning, we had our business meeting, and it was my first year leading the business meeting. And so I wanted to share with you just uh, some of the new initiatives coming from the executive team that we discussed. The executive team has four missional objectives, things that we have been commissioned by the, re the region to go out and do. And those are to care for pastors, to develop leaders, to multiply congregations, and to strengthen churches. And so our new initiatives this year under those um, categories, there are four of them. The first is that we have a new partnership with the Alliance Defending Freedom. This is an organization, a nonprofit group that provides legal consultation and representation to churches. And so the association is paying for a membership for all of our churches so that we can go to them for a legal advice. And if we face um, a lawsuit or uh, prosecution, they provide um, representation for us for anything regarding religious freedom. Uh, the second initiative is that we are, have a partnership with Forte Counseling, which is a phone counseling service. And again, the association is paying for this on behalf of all the churches so that all of the pastors and staff at any of our churches can pick up the phone at any time and talk for free to a counselor. And that is a great resource for us to be able to provide. Uh, another new initiative is matching 403B grants. We have a lot of churches who have nothing in place to help provide for their pastor's retirement. And so the, the NAB conference for a long time now has matched the first $300 that a church contributes. And now the association is going to match the next $300. So $1,200 is not a lot, but it's getting the ball rolling. And throughout the next year, we're going to be talking to elder teams and finance teams at churches who have nothing in place to help them learn how to get those things in place for their pastors. And the final one, and I think the most exciting one, is Kairos University. This is a ministry of Sioux Falls Seminary, which is our NAB school. They offer a program that students can take part of in their local context without leaving their home, without leaving their church, and they can pursue an undergrad or a graduate level degree for $300 a month, which is already an amazing price for that type of education. But the new grant system that we have put in place this year um, says that if a local supporting church will back their students and support them with $100 a month, the association will match that with another $100 a month. That means that the students will be paying $100 a month for their theological education. And the most exciting part about that is that we already have two members of CCBC that are enrolling in that program, and you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. So lots of good and exciting things happening. That Those meetings are the last weekend of October every year, so they're open to anybody from the NAB churches who would like to come and get a sense of what God is doing across the region. So if that's something that interests you, pull out your calendar now and mark the last sun weekend of August or October down next year and come be a part of that. But this morning, we're moving into the second half of John chapter 20. Last week, Jason Robinson um, walked us through the passage where uh, the disciples encountered the empty tomb and Mary 
uh, meets the risen Savior. And so I want to put the timing of today's passage in context before we start to read. So we saw at the beginning of chapter 20 that it was early on the first day of the week. That Sunday morning, the day that Jesus rose, Mary goes to the tomb and finds it empty. And she goes back and tells the disciples and Peter and John, run with her to the tomb and find it empty. They return and then she stays behind and Jesus reveals himself to her. She goes back and tells the disciples, I've seen the Lord. He has risen. It's later that afternoon, we read in Luke 24, the two other disciples are on the road to Emmaus. One of them is named Cleopas. The other one is not named in the passage. So these aren't two of the 12. These are two of the larger group of disciples. And while they're on the road, Jesus appears to them. And he begins explaining the things that they should have known, but that they missed out on. And he says to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So these two disciples, they return and they tell the rest, we have, we've seen Jesus, he is alive. And then it's John, or sorry, Luke, as he introduces the passage that we're going to read today, he introduces it with the words, while they were still talking about this. It is now evening of that same day. In the morning, Jesus meets with Mary. In the afternoon, he meets the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And now in the evening, he is about to reveal himself to at least the 10 of the disciples and probably even a larger group that was gathered around them. So that is our context as we begin to read. But before we read, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word and the truth that it contains. We thank you for your spirit, which leads us into that truth. And this morning, we thank you especially for the miraculous events that it recounts to us of your death and your resurrection and what that means for our life. And so this morning, as we read, we pray that your spirit would open our eyes, open our hearts to hear and to respond to what you have to say to us today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So John chapter 20, we're beginning in verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed, him, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. With what, and, what, and with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace, peace. Be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So it was evening of that first day that we have already described, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. There's probably a lot of emotions going on in this room. Certainly we understand that the, the person they've been following, the person that they've devoted themselves to, has been killed, has been murdered in a brutal and gruesome way, and for all they know, they might be next. For all they know, the people who put Jesus on the cross might be coming for them, and so they are in fear. 
And yet, they've also heard two reports now of the risen Jesus. And so they might be excited. They're probably confused. And so there's this whole, you know, pot of emotion stirred up in that room. I can only imagine what they might have been thinking and feeling at that time. And in the midst of that, it says that with the doors locked, Jesus came and stood among them. And I think that John emphasizes the locked doors here and later in the passage so that we understand the way in which Jesus appeared. He didn't come in through the door. He didn't crawl in through a window. He appeared in the middle of them there in his resurrected body. And the thought of Jesus in his resurrected body makes us stop and wonder what that body was like. And it's important for us because it's what our resurrected bodies will be like. We know that Jesus' body was a real physical body. They could see it. They could touch it. They could put their hands in his womb. Later on, we see him eating a fish. But we also see that it was unbelievable bound by the laws of physics, that he was able to appear in that room with them. And a few weeks ago, we read about our citizenship in heaven. And the passage that we read went on to talk about the resurrected body, which wasn't our topic of conversation two weeks ago, but it had said something really interesting for us today. We read in Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body, like his resurrection body as he appeared to the disciples. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians to say, what is sown is perishable, that is the body that goes into the ground, but what is raised is imperishable, It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. And so we get just a glimpse of what our resurrection bodies may be like. But it's important for us to understand when this takes place. This isn't what happens the moment that you die, because the Bible says that when we die, our body is buried and our spirit returns to God, right? Our spirit and body are separated, one is buried and the other is with the Lord. So so heaven is a present spiritual reality. It's a place where our soul resides as it awaits the resurrection of the dead. And so what we see here when we think about our resurrection body is following Jesus' return, when the dead are raised, our soul and body are reunited, and that body is perfected, it is imperishable, it lasts forever, and we live with Christ upon the new earth. So that is the picture that we have as we think about our resurrected body. But Jesus comes and he stands in the midst of them in his resurrected body and he says, peace be with you. He's probably speaking Hebrew, so he, he says to them, shalom alechem. And it's, it's a familiar greeting, but it's much more than a greeting because it is the fulfillment of a promise that he'd given to them just three days ago. Just three days ago, he had said to them, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. They've been living in fear and Jesus comes into their midst and he brings them peace. And because of this peace, we see as in the book of Acts, which is just a month and a half later, they are no longer cowering in fear. They're no longer hiding behind a locked door. They're out preaching boldly, not concerned about being arrested, not concerned about being killed, but with boldness and confidence because they have in them the peace of Jesus Christ, the peace that surpasses understanding. And so we see the first thing that Jesus brings to his disciples following his resurrection, is peace. The second thing that he brings to them is joy. It says, after he said this, he showed them his hands inside, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. This is the fulfillment of another promise that he had given to them just two days ago. Because two days ago, he said, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. 
It will be a lasting joy that is not dependent upon your circumstances, but it will be deep and enduring, and no one can take it away from you. It is the joy of the Lord. So he brings them peace, he brings them joy, and then he gives them a mission. In verse 21, he says to them again, peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Last week, Jason talked about John 3.16, and now we get to hear that passage from a different angle, because in John 3.16, it says that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus into the world so that anyone who believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. And the same way that God sent Jesus into the world to provide for the forgiveness of sins, he now sends us into the world to preach the forgiveness of sins through him. And it's in this moment, with this mission, that the disciples become the apostles. Because a disciple is someone who follows. They're followers of Jesus Christ. But an apostle means one who is sent. And so now the disciples are sent into the world. D.A. Carson says it this way, now that Jesus' disciples no longer belong to the world, they must go back into the world in order to bear witness. And so it is with us. We have this mission. We've talked about the fact that we do not belong to this world. We are resident aliens, but we are sent into this world to bear witness. Whatever community we live in, that's where we have been sent to bear witness. So he brings them peace, he brings them joy, he gives them a mission, and then he gives them the Holy Spirit. In verse 22, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it's, it's interesting to think about how this passage compares to what we read in Acts chapter 2, because Acts chapter 2, a month and a half after this, we see the disciples receiving the Holy Spirit and going out and preaching boldly. So how does this gift of the Holy Spirit re- compare to that one? John Calvin articulated it this way. He said, the disciples are here sprinkled with the grace of the Spirit, but not saturated with its full endowment of power until Acts 2. That may be. A more common interpretation is that this event is yet another promise of endowment of the Spirit that is yet to be given. But either way, we, do, we see in Acts chapter 1 that the disciples are still waiting. They're still waiting for that gift of the Spirit because in Acts 1-4, Jesus tells them before he ascends into heaven, he says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. So they're still waiting for the gift of the Holy Spirit. But what's even more important in Acts chapter 1 is what he says the Spirit will do. He says, but you will receive power. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Spirit will bring the power to accomplish the mission that they have been given, and the Spirit that is given to them is the same Spirit that is given to each and every one of us. He brings us peace, he brings us joy, he gives us a mission, and he gives us the Holy Spirit to empower us to accomplish that mission. And then in verse 23, he says something which is going to sound uh, confusing at first because it sounds like he is giving to them something that belongs to God alone, and that is the ability to forgive sin. We saw Jesus earlier say that no one can forgive sin but God alone, and then he forgives sin, declaring himself to be God. So we know that that's not what he is saying. What What is he saying in verse 23 when he says, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, They are not forgiven. I think he's talking about our role, the role that God has given to each one of us in the process of bringing about salvation. I think he's talking about what Paul will call the ministry of reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against him. That's God's part. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That's our part. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. It's what Paul describes in Romans 10 when he says, how can they call on the one they haven't believed in? How can they believe in the one they haven't heard of? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can they believe unless someone tells them the good news? John Marsh, coming back to verse 23, says that what is being described in verse 23 is simply the result of the preaching of the gospel, which either brings men to repent as they hear of the ready and costly forgiveness of God, or leaves them unresponsive to the offer of forgiveness, which is the gospel, and so they are left in their sins. He's talking about the ministry of reconciliation, but I want to come back to the last line of that passage in 2 Corinthians where he says that we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. That's a remarkable phrase and a remarkable image that God is making an appeal to the people within your sphere of influence, the people who he is reaching with the gospel. He is appealing to them, but he is making his appeal through you. That you are God's means of appealing to the people within your sphere of influence. What an interesting picture. Isn't that powerful? That we get to be God's appeal in someone's life. So recapping this portion of the passage before we move on, the, res the encounter with the resurrected Jesus brings peace. It brings joy. It gives us a mission it empowers us with the Holy Spirit and entrusts us with the ministry of reconciliation. So now we move on to one week later and to the account of Thomas. And this is, this is a great opportunity for anyone here today who is struggling with doubt. Maybe you haven't received the gospel. Maybe you haven't come to that point of decision. You might see a little bit of yourself in Thomas here. In verse 24, it says that Thomas, called Didymus, Thomas would be his Hebrew name and Didymus would be his Greek nickname. Didymus means twin, so presumably Thomas was a twin, otherwise his nickname is Odd. But he was called Thomas the twin, one of the twelve. He was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. So what does Thomas have? He has reliable first-hand witness account of the risen Jesus. He has someone in his life that he knows and he trusts who says, I have seen Jesus. He is not dead. He is alive. And that is what we have in Scripture. We have the reliable, first-hand eyewitness account of the resurrected Christ. John writes to us, it is the things that we have seen, that we have touched with our own hands. That's what we are proclaiming to you. We were there. We saw it. It's true. We have the first-hand eyewitness account. We also have the testimony of the people in our life who have experienced the changed life that comes about through faith in Jesus Christ. We have somebody in our life who says, I believe Jesus, and he changed my life. And I can testify that this is true. But it wasn't enough for Thomas. So he says to them, unless I see the nail marks in my hands and I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas takes on the position of a skeptic. Now skepticism is the attitude of doubt as to the truth of something. And skepticism can be good in one way. If you remember in Acts, the church in Berea, Luke, describes the church of Berea as more noble. He says they were no, more noble because they searched the scriptures to test the truth of what they were being told. They heard what, the, what they were being told, and they went out and they searched out the truth. 
They sought the facts. They sought the evidence. They weighed it carefully to say, are these things true? So they came at it with that mindset of a skeptic, that we are going to search this out for ourselves to determine its truth. So in that aspect, the attitude of a skeptic can be good. But the attitude of a skeptic can be bad. It can be detrimental when it becomes an excuse for indecision. Because there are times where we take pride in our skepticism. We wear it like a badge and we say, well, I'm just not going to believe anything, right? Well, there's a phrase that Mandy and I often say that not deciding is deciding. That no, deci make, no decision is making a decision. If you are, you are lost at sea and there's a ship that comes up and they lower the rope down to you and they say, climb aboard, and you say, well, I want to think about that for a little while. I'm not sure if I want to climb aboard this ship. Not making the decision to climb on that ship is making the decision to remain in the water. I read two statistics this week. The first statistic is that 100% of people die. It's part of our human condition that every one of us, unless Jesus returns during our lifetime, every one of us is going to die. There is no exception. And the second statistic I read that one person dies every half second. Two people die every second. So if you're a musician, you know 120 beats per minute. That is the rate at which people are dying on this earth. Every click of the metronome is another death. Now some of those people are dying knowing the love of their Savior, having the assurance of salvation, going to be with God. Some of those people are dying as skeptics, never having made a decision, and by not deciding to climb into the boat, they have decided to remain in the water. You cannot remain a skeptic. There comes a point in time where every one of us must make that decision to take that leap of faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. The decision that Jesus puts before Thomas when he tells him, stop doubting and believe. In verse 26, it says, a week later, the disciples were in the house again, and this time Thomas is with them, and again the doors are locked, and again Jesus stands among them, and again he says, peace to you. And then he turns to Thomas and he says, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. First thing that it would be easy to miss in that is that it's, Jesus makes it clear that he heard Thomas. He heard his doubt. And he shows his omniscience. He shows his presence. He shows his concern. He heard Thomas's doubt. But he comes to him and he says, stop doubting and believe. It is the time to make a decision. And Thomas responds with a proclamation of faith when he says, my Lord and my God. That is his act of receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. In Romans 10, Paul writes, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And that is the profession that Thomas makes here and now. He crosses over from doubt into belief. He crosses over from death into life. And Jesus said to him, you, because you have seen me, you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And he's talking about us because he knows that he's about to return to the Father. And he knows that those who are going to believe are going to have to believe on the testimony of the witnesses. They're going to have to believe on the reliable firsthand eyewitness account to his death and resurrection. That's who he prayed for back in John 17 when he says, my prayer is not for them alone, not only for his 12 disciples, but he, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's what Peter's talking about in 1 Peter when he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. 
And after that, John, the author of this, makes it incredibly personal because he turns and he addresses you. And he says to you that Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. These things are written that you might believe, that you might cross over from doubt into faith. One pastor I was listening to recently, Pastor Eric Hernando, uh, said three things that happened when we, re- when we encounter the risen Savior. He said, number one, we cross over or we overcome fear and we find peace. We find the peace of God that transcends understanding, the peace of God that overcame the disciples' fear and enabled them to live boldly and courageously. We we overcome fear and we find peace. Number two, we overcome sin. We find forgiveness. And finding forgiveness, we become ambassadors for Jesus Christ, testifying to that offer of forgiveness. And finally, we overcome doubt and we find faith. We're going to move into our time of communion this morning. And a week ago, I was leading communion for at the association meeting. And, and as we read at the account of Jesus last night when he instituted this symbolic action that we're going to take place in, we recognized that he didn't say very much about how. He didn't say whether uh, this act is to be a meal or a ceremony. He didn't talk about if we're going to use wine or juice bread or crackers or little plastic cups. He didn't say much about when we celebrate it. He said, do this as often as you do it. He didn't say much about when or how, but he said an awful lot about why. He spoke with clarity about the event to which these elements point. He said, this bread is my body that was broken for you. This cup represents my blood that was shed on the cross to purchase the forgiveness of sin. This is what I have done for you. So eat it and drink it in remembrance of me. Now this is an act, an act that is for the believer. It is not one that is for the unbeliever. But if you're here this morning and you are still a skeptic, if you are still remaining in doubt, this can be the morning that you cross from doubt into faith. And if that's you, if you are ready to make that decision, if you are ready to take that step of faith this morning, I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And if you pray with me to receive Jesus, to receive his forgiveness, then we'll invite you to come with us and celebrate this act together. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I understand that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that you are who you say you are, that you are the Son of God, and that you have given your life in my place so that my sin may be forgiven and my relationship with God restored. Jesus, I confess you as Lord. I desire to follow you, my Savior and my God. Amen. Whether that is true of you for the first time today or whether that's been true of you for decades, we invite you to come up the center aisles and take the elements and celebrate together.